suffering is a part of life. No, wait, that, that's not a great way to start an inspiring talk. How about life gives us many opportunities to practice compassion and self-compassion? Yeah, much better. When I was 30 years old, my beautiful daughter was born. Now, you might be thinking to yourself that that must just be a few short years ago. <laughs> Thank you. I moisturise. Actually, Freya recently turned 21. So it was 21 years ago that she was born. And it was wonderful. She was the perfect little baby, quite objectively. I wrote her a song that went, One sweet girl has changed my world and left me in a daze. Her loveliness, it warms my heart. The fire is all ablaze. Thank you. What happened next hit us all very hard. When Freya was just eight months old, she had an acute and terrifying medical emergency. She'd been having some trouble with her tummy, but at eight months, her tummy shut down and she was raced to hospital. Before we knew it, she was in the operating theatre. Her gut simply wasn't working, they said. And after surgery, she was fighting for her life in hospital with a colostomy and being fed via parenteral nutrition. This was a time of great suffering for Freya and for all of us. Now, just before I go on, Freya has grown into a strong, passionate, caring, compassionate woman. She's really thriving these days, although she does still have to manage many of those same medical challenges. But back in those early days, her life was in the balance. She was suffering, physically and emotionally. I can still picture her little face, the anguish, her eyes pleading with me whenever there were needles, drips, swabs, nasogastric tubes. An opportunity to practice compassion? Well, it sounds a bit funny to say it like that. It was certainly a chance for me to step up to the plate and do something to try to lessen her suffering. Compassion is a sensitivity to suffering in self and others with a commitment to try to alleviate and prevent it. The first flow of compassion is towards others. There are two other flows, but I'll get back to those in a few minutes. And to be honest, when it came to Freya and all that she was going through, it really took no effort at all. My compassionate motivation was, well, unstoppable. It was textured with feelings of great concern, anxiety, even panic at times. But the underlying motivation was to be caring, supportive, helpful, and to try to alleviate her suffering. I can remember many other inspiring acts of compassion. Her mother, of course, who was rarely away from her side. Her grandparents, who were always there, ready to offer practical support. And also the nurses and doctors looking after her care. All of us being sensitive to her suffering and committed to taking helpful action. Have a bit of a think yourself. What experiences have you had being compassionate towards others? Or perhaps seeing other people acting with that same compassion. And consider, what could you do to promote compassion in the world? Who could you help? Family, friends, strangers, 
at home or at work or in the community, locally or further afield, abroad. There are many ways that we can practice compassion. For us with Freya, it was the simple things. Really being present, offering her physical comfort, responding to her distress with soothing voice tones. I did a lot of soothing voice tones. Tone is so important when it comes to compassion. Warm, friendly, reassuring, comforting, soothing voice tones. On the other hand, compassionate action involves strength, courage, advocacy. We did a lot of all that too. So time passed and Freya's condition continued to have its ups and downs. A lot of trips to hospital, a lot of surgeries for the poor little thing. And a lot of compassion flowing out from me to her. But I wasn't letting a lot of compassion flow in. My mother would call and say, so how are you? And I'd say, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> I wasn't fine. In fact, we were all struggling with it. But I certainly wasn't looking after myself. I had to look after Freya. I had to be strong. I had to keep going. But could I? I certainly wasn't sleeping properly. And I certainly wasn't eating properly. I had this feeling that if Freya couldn't eat, which was part of her condition, then neither will I. My mother was trying to offer me compassion, but I wasn't letting it in. A lot of people can have fears about this second flow of compassion, which is receiving compassion from others. We can have certain fears about being compassionate towards others as well. Although somehow being compassionate towards others often feels easier than allowing others to be compassionate towards us. Perhaps you've noticed this yourself. Perhaps you're a very compassionate person towards others. But if someone offers to help you, well, you politely decline. We worry that receiving compassion will make us appear weak. Or we worry that the other person's motivations aren't genuine. Or we worry that if we let someone in, our very difficult emotions will be too overwhelming. Certain professions can have particular problems with this. Can you guess which ones? The helping professions. Yes, and psychologists like me. <laughs> so there I was, trying to be compassionate towards Freya, but refusing kindness, care, helpfulness from others. And I was on a pathway to burnout. This is a problem. When there's an imbalance across these flows of compassion, we can quite quickly become depleted, exhausted, and unable to be compassionate towards anyone. We want our compassion to be sustainable. We want to keep helping others. So we need to gradually open ourselves up to receiving compassion from others in order to keep the whole thing going. One day, I was doing my thing about not eating. I think I was trying to be in solidarity with Freya. But on this particular day, my mother quietly approached me. And she said, here, have this chocolate milk. I'm sure it'll feel good to have a little bit of something in your tummy. An offer of compassion. This time, I accepted it. For starters, I'm a big fan of chocolate milk. <laughs> but also, I knew I needed it. 
And she was right. I felt a lot better and I started letting more people in, accepting their care and compassion. Now, you might have noticed that I'm still missing one particular flow of compassion, the third flow, which is offering compassion to ourselves, or self-compassion. I was so fearful during those times, often angry and terribly sad. And I could be super critical with myself, never feeling like I was doing enough or being enough. Self-compassion was a big one, but it took me several years before I could finally begin to be more compassionate towards myself. There were three reasons that I was fearful of self-compassion. The first, I felt like I needed to be compassionate towards others, and I didn't deserve my own compassion. This is a common one. A lot of people feel like they don't deserve their own compassion, and they worry that self-compassion is too much like self-pity. Perhaps they were raised to have a stiff upper lip or to not cry over spilt milk, or maybe they were told, I'll give you something to really cry about. Our experiences shape us and can result in some very difficult blocks to self-compassion. The second reason that I was fearful of self-compassion was I was a little bit too attached to all that self-criticism. We feel like self-criticism will motivate us and help us achieve, and self-compassion will make us self-indulgent or lazy. It's quite the opposite, of course. Self-compassion is associated with greater motivation. But that was definitely one of my big fears early on. And the third reason? I was very concerned that if I started to compassionately approach those parts of myself that were suffering, then I would experience too much distress, too much grief, and it would all just be too much. Better, I thought, to not even go there. We can often have fears of this kind of emotional backdraft. You know when there's a fire and you're meant to touch the door to see if it's hot? If you open the door, the oxygen goes flooding in and the flames come rushing out at you. Self-compassion can feel a bit like that because we're opening the door to our own suffering and that can hurt although it does give us a chance to try to work out how to alleviate that suffering. Nevertheless, self-compassion was the most difficult flow for me. A lot of fears and blocks that got in my way. And it wasn't until 2014, when I went on some retreats and some workshops, that I finally began to make sense out of how to be compassionate towards myself how to validate my emotional experience of things, my suffering, how to reassure myself that things will change, things will pass, how to affirm myself, my strengths and positive qualities, and how to encourage myself to work out what I really need right now, what would be most helpful for me, what could I do that would be in the service of my own health and well-being. What would that be like for you if you could really connect with self-compassion? Validating, reassuring, affirming, encouraging yourself. The approach that I've studied and researched is compassion-focused therapy, developed by Professor Paul Gilbert. And there's a lot of evidence now that we can help people cultivate compassion across those three flows, as well as help reduce their fears of compassion. Here at the University of Queensland School of Psychology Compassionate Mind Research Group, 
we've conducted several studies testing compassion-focused therapy with various people in various life situations. And we've found that this approach can be helpful for those struggling with body and weight-related shame. Veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder and people recovering from the traumatic effects of childhood abuse. Compassion is a powerful aid to psychological well-being. Cultivating compassion and self-compassion can help reduce self-criticism and shame, post-traumatic stress symptoms, depression and anxiety, as well as promote flourishing. Which brings me back to my most important teacher of compassion, my daughter Freya. She showed me what it's like to feel truly and deeply moved to be compassionate towards another person. And she also taught me that to sustain my compassion, I needed to gradually, slowly open myself up to receiving compassion from others. And through it all, I learned that to manage my own self-criticism, my own shame, my anger, anxiety, sadness, I needed to widen my circle of compassion to also include myself. Above all, I've learned that we all have opportunities to practice compassion and self-compassion in our lives. So, given all of this, where will you start Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.